Welcome to the Spring Boot Actuator tutorial. It will show you how to get a Spring Boot application running with the awesome power of Actuator, built-in production grade monitoring facilities that can show you things like live stack traces, the configuration you're running with, the heap you're using, and even underlying OS stats. It's very impressive. We will quickly make the full project from scratch focusing on the required Spring Boot dependencies and Actuator itself. If you are not comfortable with Maven, then please watch my Maven and IntelliJ tutorial, which is on the same YouTube channel. It will help you get up to speed. One last thing before we begin is that you can find the full code for this project on GitHub. The link will be provided at the end of the video. That project actually has some extra things in it that allow it to be run as an init D service on Linux. Uh, that will be part of an upcoming tutorial separate from this one. Before we move on to the code, let's just analyze the dependencies we need. You need three dependencies in order to get the example working, plus the Spring Boot parent pom on top of it. The parent pom gives you the base Spring Boot requirements and it pre-selects Spring versions for everything. So if, for example, you needed another library that we're not using here, like Spring Data, um, you would just ask for it without the version and it would make sure that you got one that was compatible with everything used with the parent pom. Aside from the starter POM, the other things that we need are the Spring Boot Starter Web dependency, which provides Spring MVC, and then we need Spring Boot Actuator, which provides the production-ready monitoring services that this whole tutorial is about, and finally we need one called H-A-T-E-O-A-S. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but it's basically for uh, RESTful dependencies. This will make the directory listing that you get in JSON from the actuator services browsable so that you can like click around and navigate between the different pages. Otherwise you'd have to know the endpoints in advance and it's a little bit harder to use. Moving on to the code, let's create a new project in IntelliJ. We'll create it as a Maven project from an archetype, which is basically just a project template, and we'll use the quick start archetype. The quick start archetype basically just gives us a nice folder structure and a main class as an example for how to run things. Uh, we can use any group ID we want. I'll use com.john.humphreys.sb for Spring Boot. And I'll use Spring Boot as the artifact name as well. Moving on, I'll also just call the project XB to be simple. We'll tell it to create the project in the current window and to make sure our Maven auto import is set so that our libraries that we put in Maven are automatically taken down. And uh, after that, the IDE should just auto import things and uh, be ready for use. Now that we have our project set up, we need to tailor it to be a web app and we need to also pull in the Spring Boot dependencies that we uh, visited in the previous slides. So uh, going into that, we will go under main and create our resources directory. That will hold our application.properties file, which we'll just mock up now. Spring Boot will be smart enough to pull that in automatically for us once we have it set up properly. And uh, we'll also create our web app directory, which will have our sample web page or whatever we choose to use. Jumping into the POM file, we will add our Spring Boot parent POM. And then we will add dependencies for all the things we listed before. And then we will add a build plugin. The build plugin again will let us actually package our project as an executable jar and will actually let us run it from the IDE for testing purposes. Moving on, now we will need to go to our main class and turn it into a Spring Boot application. Uh, the first step in this is we can add the at spring boot application annotation 
this does the heavy lifting and adds all the things that we need to have a runnable Spring Boot application. And then we go to the main function and we'll need to tell it to actually run the Spring application by saying Spring application dot run app dot class args. We need to import the Spring application class while we do that. And then we can give a nice message saying your site is running. So with that, we should have a runnable Spring Boot application. And we can actually launch it by using that Spring Boot Maven plugin that we talked about earlier. Keep in mind, though, we haven't done anything to actually make this a website at this point in time. Notice in the console how it's running with Spring Boot flags and everything's up and you get your message. At this point, I'm going to gloss past a few things because I want to get to the actuator stuff. So we will go into our web app and create an index.html file. That's, this is going to be our main page, our site homepage, and I'm just going to copy in a very small website page that does one jQuery message, that'll hit a controller. And then we're going to go up here and we're going to create a new directory for a controller for Spring MVC, and we're going to create a controller named Home Controller. Again, we're just going to copy paste in a Spring MVC controller that I've written before, since this is not a tutorial on Spring MVC. Um, and this controller basically just gives that one page web page the things it needs, which it involves a custom message and an AJAX URL, so it can get some dynamic content from our application. At this point, we're close to having a working website. We just have to set up our configuration, and uh, then we can run and see what we've got. So configuration-wise, we need four things. I'm just going to copy them in for speed again. We need the server port, which is going to be 9001. That'll be where the website runs. We need the management port, which will be where Actuator runs for all of our metrics. We need the custom message that our one web page uses and our controller pulls out. And then we're actually going to have the actuator context path as well. This is the site page that we'll go to to see the actuator stuff. Once this is all in here, we should be able to run our application with the Spring Boot Run Maven plugin again. And uh, if we wait a second for it to be up, we should be able to go to localhost. 9001 and see our web page. So this is awesome. And uh, with this, we can move on to the actuator stuff. So we've actually set up everything that we needed to in order to use actuator, and it's running on localhost colon 9002 slash actuator courtesy of the configuration we put in the application.properties file. So if we go to our browser and type in that link, we'll see the browsable endpoint that we have because of that H-A-T-E-O-A-S dependency that gave us the browsable REST endpoints. We can see all of the possible default actuator endpoints here, including ones for the environment which shows all the configuration files you've loaded, plus a whole lot of information about the PID and stuff like that. We can see another one for trace, which shows you a live running stack trace, which is very cool. This actually shows you which calls have been hit. So for example, we have this slash message Ajax endpoint that was used on our single page website we went to earlier. We have a beans endpoint, which shows you all the loaded spring beans which is very cool if you're using Spring dependency injection on top of normal Spring Boot stuff, which most applications probably would. 
Um, there's a dump URL, there's a metrics URL, which is very cool too. This shows you the free memory, the amount of processors, uptime, load average. The load average looks like it's minus one here for some reason. But anyway, you got heap stats, the maximum threads you've used, the amount of loaded classes, garbage collection stats, and all kinds of other things. And uh, you can actually add any amount of extra endpoints that you want here as well, which is very cool. Uh, there's also a default health endpoint, which can be used as a normal uptime monitor. And on top of this, this endpoint will detect any database connections and display whether or not they're up or down so that you can tell if your databases are okay. This is very good for like automated support monitoring. Anyway, with all this, you should be able to see the power behind Actuator and how nice it is to have this kind of monitoring on all of your production applications out of the box without any help. And um, we'll have other tutorials in the future which will show you how to add new custom endpoints to this, which will let you show any amount of extra information you need to help your support monitoring infrastructure. Thank you for watching, and there will be many follow-ups to this. Please uh, continue checking out this YouTube channel, and thank you for your time.